Hello again, it's your boy, the one and only Sir Patrick of the Department of Biology. Uh, before we start our lecture for 3 and 4, I would like to give you some friendly reminders on our reading list. So, yep, I hope you have already read our reading materials in the VLE course site, starting with the Biogeography of Puzon Island by Benjamin Vallejo. So, be sure to mark all those important things in the reading. So, just like what I did here. Yep. Especially the dispersal route. All I want to all of those things. Pay attention to the maps, of course. So yeah, I have read it again for the fifth time in my life. And the biotic regions. Dun dun dun. So be sure to read this because it will be included in our exam. Okay? So yeah. Same goes true with the reading material Philippine in Walasi. So also by Benjamin Balia. And this is more specific to the Philippine setting in the Walasi. So be sure to read it thoroughly as it will help you navigate the course. Okay? So pay attention to the, well, to the Walasi lines, the Indo-Malayan lines, the Weber, the Lidiker, Lidiker, the Huxley, the Wallace lines, and the lines that I have made you draw. Okay? And the, well, I have already discussed this, the geologic reconstruction of how the Philippines was formed. The different possible island groups if there was an ice age. The floral sub-provinces. So those are the important things in this reading. And of course, the last one, the last important one in that set would be the case of marine system. So the faunal breaks and species composition of Indo-Pacific corals and the roles of plate tectonic, tectonics in the, well, clustering analysis. So um, for the case of this reading, I'd like you to skim the part that talks about the methodology because you don't really need that and it is heavily based on some statistical analysis that but well, some of you probably didn't encounter in your bio 101 class and the most important part is this part no where it talks about the different marine clusters no for the case of your indo-pacific corals so most of our distribution patterns our boundaries and regions, no, biogeographical regions that we'll talk about, mainly focuses on, well, terrestrial ecosystems, terrestrial habitats, no, terrestrial regions. But for the case of this reading material, it focuses mainly on the different regions or clusters that are marine in nature. So this is specific for your coral groups no so it is also a faunal division based on your coral groups so these are different maps different clusters right here that is based on well one faunal provinces based on diversity of corals so just like what happens in your terrestrial biome or terrestrial realms or boundaries we also have certain boundaries or lines no? of your for the case of your indo-pacific corals so yeah it's a well a good read because it pegs on the idea that although the marine ecosystem is quietly connected to well in itself no our oceans are 
our seas are connected, but there is a certain boundaries between different coral groups. All of this will be included in our exam, so pay attention to them. Okay? Or I would just like to add that I always edit our Bio 165 Biogeography VLE course site. So I always change the content that I upload there. And as you can see, I've hidden some, well, more or less redundant materials that you don't need to really, well, dwell much on to understand the course. So I, I have left some very important YouTube links for you, but some I already took them down. So yeah, I hope by doing that, by removing some of the YouTube links and reading materials, I have lessened the burden for you and you can, well, start focusing on our YouTube videos. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for <laughs> submitting, so just for submitting the different lines. So yeah, Godoy line, Sebas Sabas line, and many more lines that are here. I actually enjoyed reading them. And well, some of you made some pretty interesting points. It's actually interesting to see how you guys responded to the reading materials because this exercise, this activity on your very own Wallace line is a very good gauge of how you understand the reading materials that I have sent to you. And it goes to show how difficult and problematic the Wallace E is, no? the Wallace E, yeah, the Wallace line is. Um, it's really important that we have this academic discussion on where we put the line, the delineations of the Asiatic and the Australian, well, fauna, no? And I also been watching how many of you have already, well, in past or submitted their topic, discussion topic in the Tracing Our Roots. So I will not discuss this here on lecture 3 and 4, but they will be included for the next lecture on dispersion because we'll focus on the story of the humans, how we have migrated from Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to the different areas of the world. And for the last part, I would like you to still, so the deadline for this part, this uh, activity is still on October 20. So you can still post your or update your answers on the different, well, your different views on the Noah's Ark, a uh, biographical story arc. So parang anime yan, anime story arc. But yep. I'll just like to mention that this is not to, well, incite any problems between religions, no? It's purely academic. And I'd just like to know your stand on the, well, the problem or the, the story of Noah. Cutting this short, a very long introduction, let's move on to lecture three and four. So... Lecture 3 and 4 is titled, The Distribution of Species and Community. We'll first have the outline of the lecture. We only have three parts for this lecture. We have the first one, the parameters affecting distributions, which includes the physical parameters, intrinsic properties of the organism, the extrinsic properties of ecology and population dynamics, and then stochastic events, of course, the chance events that are important too. Then we'll have the distribution of life, the biogeographic regions of the Earth, both floral and faunal regions of the Earth and realms and kingdoms. And then we'll finish off with the Philippines in the Wallacea. Wallacea, 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 potato, potato. Okay? So <clears throat> the way I see it is that there are several factors affecting distribution of life here on Earth. The first one would be the physical parameters, namely temperature, 
soil or more specifically soil type or soil moisture, insulation and day length, salinity, pressure and light penetration, water availability and tides, and etc. So for all of, among all of these physical parameters that affects the distribution of life here on Earth, I would say that temperature would be the primary driving force of the distribution that we see today. It's one of the most influential factors that drive the distribution of life on Earth. So this is partly because there are certain organisms that can't thrive on certain temperature. So there are organisms that can survive or adapted in the cold climate, and there are organisms that are adapted on your very arid and very hot regions. Well, of course, there are cosmopolitan organisms that are distributed evenly among all the temperatures, but there are certain organisms that, well, can't survive on certain temperature ranges. Okay? And... The thing about these physical parameters is I would like you guys to think about how these different physical parameters would be would affect no, the present distribution of organism that we have today. Among all of these parameters, I would like you to practice and defend why would this physical parameter would in turn affect the distribution of organism that we see. So that would be your take-home practice okay so when we say soil type it's the different soil composition no uh, different ratios of your sand clay and silt and different nutrients too that is present on your soil if the soil is acidic or it has high metal content or if the soil has for example ultramafic condition or very low nutrients so it would drive the survival of your pitcher plant because they can, well, <clears throat> they can create or outsource other nutrients from trapping in no, insects. So things like that. On when, and when we say insulation, it is basically the incident solar radiation onto some, some object, no? specifically the measure of solar energy that is on a certain area for a certain period of time. How would that affect the distribution of organism? The day length for specifically for your plants and your organism that are nocturnal. And of course, we all know salinity gradient. There are species that can live on, well, low salinity, brine solution, and a very high salinity, things like that. Okay? So that would be your take-home practice. I would like you to pay attention to these different physical parameters. I would not discuss them any further. So in lecture two, I have made quite an extensive list and description of, for the context of the Philippines, the different physical geographical factors that would be affecting your distribution of life here in the Philippines. The key takeaway from that lecture is that, well, for the first part, climate and the prevailing winds the Amihan, the Habagat, and the Typhoons would predict the species distribution. No? And number two is that sometimes geography of the area or the placement of your mountains, your rivers, would intend change your climate type two, no? according to the corona system, no? the type one, type two, two, type four system here in the Philippines. And that some of this physical geographical processes are also a product of those years and years, millions of years of geological histories no? that led to the creation of the area. Okay, Climate and habitats would also affect the different species distribution that we see today. So if you have differences in mean annual temperature or and mean annual rainfall for certain areas, meaning different climates for the case of the Philippines, will have different, of course, different types of vegetation in that area. And with different types of vegetation, there, there will also be different types of organisms that will be found, no? both insects and your higher mammals, small mammals, and your bats, for example. And more importantly, the presence of different 
typhoon patterns, as we can see here, would create disturbances in your, well, your, on your area that would definitely lead to differences in distributional patterns that we will see. You know? so if you have more or less more typhoons in this area, it would create more distribution, more, I mean, more disturbance and would, well, in turn, create some successional, well, themes, no? In the distribution of life, no? It would create those events, chance events for organisms to colonize. When there's, there's a typhoon, uh, well, for example, a forest patch could be cleared. Well, if the typhoon is it's really strong, it could clear a certain area and would offer a new area for recolonization of other organism, a chance for other organism to recolonize. No? Certain things like that. As compared to areas that don't experience much dis disturbance, it would create more or less, well, established climax species. No? Especially for the case of your habitats. No? It's, well, for the case of your habitat, it would be very important too. And in conservation, it would be better to protect the habitats than the organism itself. Because these different habitats, if you have marshes, you have mossy type forests, mountain forests, if you have a lot of those things, a lot of those habitats, it could harbor different organisms. It could actually increase the number of species that you can find in that certain area. So for conservation, it would be much profitable if we protect this habitat than the species itself. And I always agree that it is much more important to protect the habitats because these habitats provide those uh, platforms for organisms to thrive in. And of course, if you have more habitats, different habitat types, it could harbor more species and therefore affecting your species distribution. So for the case of your uh, mountains in here in the Philippines, we have, well, different altitudinal ranges of your forest type. So if you have a, a very high mountains, for example, in Mount Data and here in Mount Pulag, you can see changes in vegetation type. We have mossy forest type on the upper portion and mountain forest followed by the mountain forest and the lowland forest. And if you go closer to your to the beaches in the coastlines, you could also observe different mangrove habitats and beach forests with different um, organisms too that are that can be found there. So the important thing with high elevations and these different habitat different vegetation type that you can see here is that there would be differences no in the temperature as you go up as you go higher and higher there would be a decrease in temperature and that could pose certain well chance for a temperate climate no to evolve or to be established and therefore harbor different organisms in that too no so yeah i also have first hand experience to this because uh, well that one time in band camp, <laughs> well, uh, that one time when we went to, when we had a field work in Mount Pulag, and so yeah, that's me, that's me, Dubby. Well, this was a uh, couple of years ago, couple of, uh, last year, I guess. And we ha have observed different, well, vegetation type. So if you have climbed Mount Pulag already, you can see differences in vegetation. So the topmost part of Pulag, you can see a grassland ecosystem. It is mostly bamboo grass. This is certain species. I, I think there are at least at least two species no, of bamboo grass that you can find here. And also there is, followed by that, there is also a mossy forest in Pulag. So as you go down, for quite a bit, you can observe mossy forest, and it's actually a very cool mossy forest. It's like you're in Encantadia movie. And this is also observed, not just in Pulag, but across different, the different 
mountains here in the Grand Cordillera Central in Upper Agno. You can also observe, well, this mossy forest. No? And we have your lower mountain as you go down and there are also pine forests and then vegetable gardens for your locals. But yeah, that's Mount Tulag. That's an example of different vegetation type across the elevational gradient. And of course, these uh, differences in, well, in your vegetation and in your temperature could also create your elevational diversity patterns in your small mammals too. It could create differences in pattern across this elevational gradient. So as you can see here in this slide, certain species can be found on certain eleva elevations, while uh, some species are not found on certain areas. So there could be certain speciation event and endemism that can happen due to the preferences of this species on your elevation. There is a certain diversity patterns too for your small mammals. And then next would be the intrinsic properties of your organism. So yep, that's my rabbit. <laughs> that's Bao Bao. It's the rabbit of Mam Ross. I gave it away. Oh, I miss her. I miss him. The next one after the physical parameters would be the intrinsic properties of your organisms. So more importantly, for this part, the intrinsic properties is your what we call commonality and rarity of organism. When we say commonality, the commonness of organism is that organism common across different regions of the world, meaning it has cosmopolitan distribution. Like for example, your EPs <laughs> and rats. And of course, the rarity, no? meaning the rareness of your organism. Is it endemic to certain areas of the Philippines? No? We have actually a high rate of endemicity here in the Philippines. That's why we are a biodiversity hotspot. So your commonality and rarity of your organism is, of course, in turn affected or a result of the differences in the intrinsic property, no? the organism itself. So different organism, of course, have has different has have different geographic ranges. So certain organism can only be found in certain areas, and certain organism also have certain habitat tolerance. No, can only be found on marshes or can only be found on your mountains. And some organism are common because there are many of them. And some are rare because there are few of them in nature or they are near in extinction, actually. But all of this, all of this are intrinsic to the organism, meaning it's the natural ability, no? It's, it's inherent or in, in the species itself, okay? You understand that? So... Aside from the commonality and rarity of your organism, we also have the different dispersal ability of your organism. So we all know that different organisms have different dispersal rate. Some organisms, of course, are adapted to wind dispersion. And since they are adapted to dispersion by wind, they are far more easily disperse but some also trick us no humans by creating fruits so they by creating fruits they actually well trick us into scattering their seeds no? so those different intrinsic ability of and adaptations of your organisms could create different diverse um, distribution patterns of them if you have an organism that is highly dispersed, you can find them anywhere. The inherent dispersability of your organism, how good it is to be dispersed. But aside from that, even after, say for example, the organism has this high ability to be dispersed. Okay, let's say it can be dispersed easily. But 
it's not just that, no? It's not just being dispersed. You also need to be, to acquire a foothold or to be established in that specific area that you have been, been thrown on, no? So, for example, your seed has been dispersed and it landed on certain soil. It would stop there? No. It would also need to be established in that area, no? This is very true for certain invasive species. They can easily be dispersed, and when they arrive at that location, they can have a great foothold and be established on that area, and they can proliferate. But certain species, unlike your invasive species, can't do that. That's why their distribution is quite limited. It's not just the different ability of your organism. No? It's different tolerances. It's not just the dispersal ability of your organism. It also includes the ability of the organism to be established. And of course, all of this ability that is intrinsic to the organism are a product of your biological processes in that organism, the genetic material of the organism. So, yep, the mutation rate of the organism could also provide variations, and this variation, we all know, could fuel the evolution of characters. No? If certain mutation could create a highly dispersive organism, it could be triumphant and could colonize the entire world. So next is the extrinsic properties or the rules of ecology and population dynamics. It's a certain fact that these processes of your population dynamics could create changes in your distribution of organism. How so? Say, for example, an organism. If that organism doesn't have a reasonable number of individuals, it can't colonize certain areas. If it doesn't have that genetic vigor in the first place, it can't establish itself. No. So actually, the population that we're talking about here needs to have a certain degree of healthiness, certain degree of number, before it can spread, no? before it can colonize certain areas. So what we're talking about here is, for example, the density of your organism, the population dynamics, the interplay between the different processes that results to the number of organisms. So we have the dirt rate, the immigration would, well, increase the amount of population in that area. And of course, the emigration and death would in turn decrease the population size in that area. And the healthiness of this population or the presence of other population outside the area could in turn change the distribution. And we all know that there are differences, different chance events that could kill certain area, certain species in an area. And if there are representative of that species in another area that doesn't experience such, well, such um, life-changing event, no? Life-killing event, it would survive still. So yeah, popu your population can be regulated and limited by different factors. We have the density-dependent and the density-independent factors. When we say density-dependent, when you have a higher population size, the effect of these factors can be much higher. But for the case of your density-independent, the population size does not matter. The effect of natural disaster and unusual weather events or any killing event, no? any environmental events can be the same, can be the same effect all throughout, no matter how many the organism are. So those are your limiting factors. All of these factors are, of course, are of course a product of your ecology. No? That's why the study of the distribution of organism is not just a simple physical parameters. It's not just that. It also includes the different underlying ecological concepts that are in play. Specifically, the population dynamics would come into play in fruition. No? 
in reasoning out why certain species are distributed this way. And also, in line with your ecological processes you know, that affect the population and in turn affect its distribution, we also have your competition, no? specifically for competition. Because if certain or organism is to be established, it needs to outcompete the existing organism that is present in the area. This is very true for certain organisms, the invasive species. It needs to outcompete the other organism that is already established in that area for it to proliferate. On the other side of that coin would be mutualism. You know, when we say mutualism, the different interactions of your organism, both beneficial to them. And this would also increase, no, just, it's not always competition kasi. There would also be a helping team. No? We, when you have mutualism, it could benefit both of them. And if they are benefiting from each other, they could be more successful and therefore colonize more area. So yeah, competition and mutualism. And of course, there is also the conundrum between competitive exclusion principle and the coexistence of your organisms. So if you think about, for example, say for example, your marine phytoplankton. So for a certain species, a very competitive species, it is better for it to produce and produce and outcompete every organism. So if that's the case, there would be less species no? in the marine phytoplankton communities because a certain organism could outcompete all the rest if that organism is a very fit individual and if that organism has the ability to outcompete all of those other species right there. But that's not what we see, no? in the natural setting, in the phytoplankton communities. What we can see, what we have observed, is that there is actually more species no, than it is predicted by the competitive exclusion principle. Because in the natural setting, it is much more beneficial if there is coexistence between different species. But the reason behind that is not quite clear until now. It's actually the paradox of the phytoplankton, of the plankton, no? Because instead of seeing competitive exclusion principle triumphantly reducing the number of species, we see many species of phytoplankton that are coexisting with each other. So yeah, so that's that, no? That's the paradox of the plankton. Another example, example would be for the case of your shipworms, no? The, the tamilok or, well, tamilok is a more a local term, no? A, a local species. But we have your shipworms, no? You... Uh, the worms in the woods of your, well, the old ship back then was made of wood. And this worm would colonize these um, this large wood beams. And what, have they, and what they find out is that there is actually a very rich community of ship worms. No? Different species of ship worm could be found across a single slab of the wood, no? And what they have seen is that these uh, species have actually been coexisting with each other. They haven't outcompeted. No, they haven't fight. What they did is they coexisted. So there is this development of niche. No, so your certain organism, certain species of shipworm, could only colonize the top portion of the wood. Or the inner portion of the wood and others are on the fringes so things like that 
there's actually the organization and development of these different niches. No? And that would also apply to the different number of species and population that we see and the distribution of population that we see today. There's actually a development of different niche, niches, no? niche minage. <laughs> so yeah, there's actually a, a development of different niches. And that affects your distribution of life. And for the last part, we have the, this is, well, for me, it's the most important one of all. This is what you call chance events or the stochastic events. So please bear this in mind when we say stochastic, those are the chance events, okay? So stochastic, or when we say stochastic in general, it pertains to randomness, no? random events. I think uh, chance events are, or this randomly determined process is what will make or break the species. As I told you, for us humans, we are a terminal species, no? homo sapiens, in our group. No? We are a terminal representative. And of course, there are other human species back then that were walking alongside us. And some of them are far superior and far better, both in the body features, they are more larger and more muscular, and they have better genes for survival. So yes, yeah, some of them are, some of these human species are far better than our species. But why is that that humans, homo sapiens, that us, are the only extant and ex existing representative of the human group? No? And you, why is that? I mean, how? How come? We're not the fittest of the bunch, no? But we're the only extant species. Why? Why though? Maybe because of God? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But the thing about that is scientists now hypothesize that one, we always live in groups. That's the reason why we are the only existing human because we always live in groups. We are protected by the numbers. That's why we can survive. And number two, that's just a chance event. We're just lucky. <laughs> We're lucky enough to be alive. No? Those chance events, those series of unfortunate events, <laughs> those series of events have aligned perfectly for us human beings to thrive. No? Those series of events favored our species. It's not because we're the fittest of the bunch, no? We're not the fittest, actually. We're so frail and weak. It's because of our, of those events, those chances that favored us. The stars indeed have aligned for our species. That's what I always imagine. It's not because we're the chosen one and the most evolved and the most brainy. Well, that did help. But if you don't have your stochastic events, the chance, no? If you don't have those chance that will be given to you by some being or by some luck, you won't survive. No? Even, you're, even if you're so fit, if you don't have the chance, you won't survive. That's why I still, I still think that this stochastic events those series of events, no? those chance, ev chance events that could favor the organism is actually an important factor in the distribution of life in, well, in the world. Chance can really go a long way. No? So give yourself a chance. No? And this might change things because, as, as they say, everybody deserves a chance. <laughs> Don't you agree? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Even paleontologic records reveals many of the rise and declines of genera. No? So say, for example, there is the existence of a given land bridge. So for example, in the Philippines. If, this, if the existence of those land bridge coincided with the maximum healthiness or genetic vigor of your population, of a given set of, well, for the case of humans or certain organisms, this group would be far better represented in the islands no? than if the bridge were 
there you know, were possible during the time that during a period that your organism is well has few numbers no it is on a dwindling population so that's the thing no? you need the stars to align for your species you need to have certain number of population to be aligned with the presence of land bridges for your species to be distributed because that's the thing about evolution and the story of the distribution of life here in the Philippines. It's not about the survival of the fittest, no? But the survival of the fit enough. That's why there is variations. Because the environment and nature, to put it, to put it simply, is a chao chaotic world. No? Chaos theory. Nga. Even mathematicians have acknowledged that even a decimal point change in your initial condition could change and redirect your outcome of the weather patterns. No? That's why variations are important so that your species or your population is flexible to the changes in the environment. So yeah, survival of the fit enough. You need this variation because as we have said it earlier, there is no such thing as adaptation, no? only adaptation meaning so abap with a b not adapt with a d okay meaning when we say adaptation all these genetic and phenotypic variants have already been present in your population all the genes all the cards are already there and all nature's got to do is to choose from that set of characters what she likes to persist in the world no? in the environment in that area and of course nature can be moody and ever-changing at times that's why we need to be flexible enough for us to survive so yep that's your stochastic events and i want you to take note of this because we all need that chance to persist just give us the chance we'll prove it to you Ikangat.